Recording in progress. So today's lesson, you yeah. can see some stuff. Is this the right section? That's the wrong one, isn't it? You guys are section 11. So let's go there, section 11. Must be because we had the wrong date. So we've got a bunch of stuff. Actually, all of those links relate to the entire week. So it's not just, uh, we, we're certainly not going to get all of this done today. We've got like an hour today. So I think the, the only thing we'll probably get through is that first lecture. Um, if we do, then you see the rest of the stuff is all word stuff. So we're so starting to get into the practical stuff. Next lesson, uh, we'll, have, we'll have you doing some word document stuff. Um, but today we still got a sort of general purpose computing discussion kind of thing going on. So let's get into that. Um, let me do it in PowerPoint. And um, hopefully that won't, this won't be too long or too painful. I think it's okay. Yeah, that's the thing, right? That's why I don't think we're going to have enough time to get on to the, uh, to the word stuff because we have 40 slides to slog through. Should be all right here though. I don't think we need to talk too long about that. Well, I thought I opened up. Oh, security alert. Okay. Should have my glasses to read what it's saying, but there we go. Computers and computer systems. Week two. Let's start. Yeah, so um, Ada Lovelace, did you have you heard of her? So this is talking about 19th century, like 1830s or something like that. I, th she, I think she was related to the uh, woman who wrote the, the book Frankenstein. Uh, so um, quite a sort of talented people. And so she was a, uh, you know, there weren't a lot of educational opportunities for women. This is, she was from UK uh, in the 19th century. As, but she was just like a brilliant mathematician. And so she went and she understood what uh, Babbage had done with his, um, his difference engine and his analytical engine, these are machines that he made that didn't use electricity, but you could use them for doing mathematical computations. She understood what, how it worked, and she actually was able to sort of write some instructions, which you could call like a computer program in how to use this difference engine and analytical engine. So she's quite a smart lady uh, from quite a long time ago, and therefore we refer to her as one of the first programming language inventors. And uh, in fact, in the 1980s, there was a computing language that was called Ada after her. There you go. Um, so uh, this, I hope this is familiar to you. Uh, the various, have we talked about this at all? Have I gone through this lecture? No. No, but we, no. We saw this picture. So, oh, we saw this picture, but it was a different one, right? All right, so I don't need to go through all of that. You've seen all of that, then uh, these different components output devices, input devices, storage devices, uh, et cetera. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So I think this is a little bit different than the other lessons. Tell me if, you, tell you me if this is repeated. I don't think so though. Um, so a computer is a programmable electronic device accepts data, performs operations and stores the data. Um, I like a different definition of data and um, information. So data is sort of less organized, less value. Then you process it and it becomes information. But the information can be data for another process. Does that make sense? That, that's my definition, right? Um, now, the other, another definition that goes with that is if we call something information, it must be useful. Data is, it must be useful for something. And so if you're a person in a business, we use a lot of information. For what? Useful for what? Useful for making decisions. And so uh, that, that's, the, that's the idea of, of an information system is to take data, which is unstructured and not so useful and make it more structured, summarize it, um, put headings, you know, uh, do sorting, uh, search and find particular components, add things together, make totals. This makes it more useful for decision making. Um, so we've got this IPOS cycle, and that's going to be the main part of this, uh, this uh, lecture. There's a little bit more after that, but we'll go through these quickly. Uh, input, entering data. So this is an input device. Um, I guess a web camera could be an input device. Um, so got keyboard, mouse, that's an input device. A microphone's an input device, and you can probably think of some others. Um, output, well, how do, how, does, how do we get that? Uh, information out of the system. Well, here, this is an output device. 
our screen uh, printers, um, speakers, uh, video, etc. Uh, storage. Now, the idea of storage is it should persist. That is, it should last some time. Uh, so when we turn off the computer, uh, what happened to all that beautiful information that we made out of the data? And what happened to our original data? Well, hopefully it's stored somewhere. So we'd call that secondary storage. And uh, you'd be, you would be familiar with many of the devices that we use for secondary storage. But they include hard drives, tapes, uh, thumb drives, and the cloud. Nowadays, so many people are doing so much stuff in the cloud um, because that has become a lot cheaper and it's, it's just a good solution. Uh, communications is an added component of um, computing, definitely. And so if you guys, are you, what are you guys' degrees again? Are you guys doing IT degrees or business digital degrees? Marketing. Uh, digital marketing, okay, that kind of thing. Uh, somebody here was FinTech. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. So if you were sort of the engineering type, seems you're more business type, that's fine. But even as a business type, you might find yourself working in a organization that does uh, communications IT, like Arito or Vodafone. They hire a lot of people that do that kind of stuff. Uh, so they hire a lot of engineers. They actually hire a lot of marketing people, a lot of digital people. I mean, you know, so you might find yourself there. Um, a lot of accounting people. I mean, they're, they're really big on all kinds of IT people. So you might find yourself there. There's a video for you to watch, which I'm not going to show you now. I'm just gonna tell you when you're at home, go and look at this video. All right, so uh, somebody else has done it. So I'm not gonna do it. They've done it, okay? So go ahead and watch it. It's in the notes, which means it could be on the test. Okay, so what's the difference between data and information? I tried to make that point a minute ago. Uh, information should be useful, useful for making decisions. Here is some unstructured data. It's unstructured. It's not particularly useful, is it? I mean, what would you do with that? And, uh, you know, as it says there, it's unorganized. The other thing is that we take data and we process it. And after it's processed, what we have is information. Processing is not free, is it? Processing costs money. You know, it costs computer time. It costs the time of the person to write the program to do the processing. So uh, why would you do it unless the thing that you got out of it was worth more than the stuff that put into it? That's what you're doing. You're adding value to the data. You're taking the data, which isn't worth very much, and you're adding some value, you're getting something valuable at the other end, which is your information. Does that make sense? So, and it's, it's valuable because we can make decisions with it. And so, look, here's that same data, but we've added some value to it. We've added quite a bit of value to it. Uh, so we've got some information here. I mean, the information, what kind of decisions could I make on that? Well, it would tell me, it would help me to know where to go on that day, right? So I probably wouldn't get dressed to go to work on Qatar National Sports Day. I might decide to go and join a football team or, you know, because <laughs> you know, not much going to be happening at work, right? Uh, likewise, for the start of Fitter, I mean, uh, this is a um, cultural celebration, uh, religious celebration. You'd have some things that you'd want to do on that day, which wouldn't involve uh, going to, to work. Um, you'd want to contact your friends, etc. And, and like, uh, sorry, family, uh, and uh, that kind of thing. Same with Qatar National Day. You might want to go down the Corniche and see flags and stuff. Uh, I don't know. Actually, uh, you know, I remember one national national day. I was down in the desert, down in um, what do you call that area? Uh, Aludade. So Aludade, you know, near, near the inland sea. There's a, we, we ride uh, our motorcycles in the desert down there. It's quite nice. And uh, I was riding over one dune, and wow, I heard this. And actually, it wasn't it wasn't National Day. It was like three days before National Day. It was it was a Qatar Air Force jet. <laughs> it was like I don't know. It's like twenty feet above me. It seemed like so I don't know. They were going to do something on National Day, I guess. But, you know, some, that was kind of cool. That was a neat experience. Uh, so data or information. I've sort of gone on about that a little bit. Um, Information provides context to data. It adds value to data. It's something that we can do something with. We paid some money for it. We did some processing on it. And now it's useful to us. Uh, hardware, if we use that word hardware, as opposed to what? As opposed to software, hard soft. So when we talk about hardware, we mean the components of the computer that we can actually see and touch. Uh, so that's hardware. And then there's software, which is the logical, logical instructions that make the hardware perform. 
And so that would be um, operating systems, programming languages. There's actually a thing halfway between, which is called firmware. You've probably heard of that as well. And so firmware will be like a, um, it'll be a chip, uh, which has got a program written into it, which won't be changed. And so you have firmware uh, placed in your car computer. You have firmware placed in, uh, yeah, the, every computer has some firmware on it. So for example, uh, your laptop computer, the firmware would include the kernel of the operating system, you know, that, that actually starts the boot up process. Uh, you have to know where, uh, sorry, the computer has to know where to, where to get its information from, sorry, where to get the, um, Oper the rest of the operating system from so it can load it into memory. And so you've got a little bit of stuff that's actually stored on a ROM chip. And th that's the first thing that is uh, read when the computer turns on. And that you would call firmware. Uh, and firmware, uh, we do, I don't know, if you get into sort of technical stuff, you'll often hear about people doing a firmware update. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, they, with the right tools, you can sometimes rewrite uh, software and firmware, or you might have to take out a chip and replace it with another one. Um, external hardware. Oh, internal and external. So when we're talking internal and external there, I think what they mean is uh, internal to the systems unit. We use that word or this case that we've got underneath our table here. Uh, the stuff that's in there, we'd call internal hardware. Uh, stuff that's outside of that, like our screen, uh, keyboard, uh, we'd call uh, external hardware. Now, be careful with that because you'll find that some computers actually are, are integrated. And so you have this big screen and then you look around, oh, where's the system unit? And the system unit's in the back of the screen. So you just buy this big screen. It's got the computer in the back. Uh, so Apple does that with their big ones. And I, actually, the, the room next door, it, uh, the computer's in there. There's no system unit under the desk. The computer's in the back of the screen. That's cool. Uh, I, it probably makes it a little bit harder to do sort of upgrades. Now, if you're like a gamer guy and you want to sort of, oh, I want to sort of, uh, how you say, um, customize my computer but to all of these special uh, um, specifications, then you probably want a box like that, right? So you can open it up easy and sort of put things in, take things out. Yeah. Uh, so the peripherals, there are things like this. Oh, great. Bit clumsy. That's peripherals, right? Uh, they're things that are outside the box and we plug them in by various ports. So these ones here are probably plugged in by uh, USB ports, uh, but they're peripheral to the system box. Mouse. A yeah, mouse. Yeah, so you don't be as hard on the peripherals as I am. Uh, mouse, uh, keyboard. Now, uh, we got them plugged in here by uh, USB ports. Um, in the old days, every different uh, peripheral had its own different type of port. You know, so you had one port for the mouse, one port for the keyboard, one port for the printer. Nowadays, we tend to sort of be standardizing the ports. Man, what took like 40 years to do that, right? We should have done that in the first place, I guess. Um, but yeah, now you'll buy a like a um, Apple uh, uh, laptop and uh, it's only got one port there, one type of port. You know, it might have multiples of them, but they're all these USB 3 ports and everything will plug into it, right? You can plug your, your key if you want a, a mouse. Well, you probably... What mouse would you use with a laptop? You'd use a Wi-Fi mouse probably, right? And then it's, yeah, or, or Bluetooth or something. Bluetooth mouse probably. Uh, okay, so here's, again, kind of old pictures, but it's all right. Uh, did we talk about this in the previous lecture at all? No. Uh, let's go through it then. So here's our peripherals. Uh, we see them. They don't have to have wires because you could replace the wires with Bluetooth or, or Wi-Fi or something, but uh, but uh, you could have them with wires. Uh, the power supply is actually quite important uh, because the computer components will only work with five volt um, direct current. And um, I am recording this, right? I think I started the recording, but just want to check. Yes. So um, it'll only work with uh, five volt direct current. That's not what's coming out of the wall. Right? What's coming out of the wall here is 230 volts alternating current uh, at 60 hertz. So 60 hertz means it changes direction 60 times a second. That's what a hertz means per second. Uh, so that's not going to work on your computer. I mean, if you had direct that plugged into the motherboard, boom, they just blow up. All the components in there would just die. So you have this thing between your power in the computer and, um, sorry, the, between the computer and the power in the wall. So what this does is it steps down the 230 volts to five volts and, and changes it to a direct current. Uh, because if you look at this, it's got, it, you know, 
uh, that's why um, they use, in some computers, they use gold. A lot of computers, they use silver. And there's copper. But I mean, you know, they use these very highly um, conductive metals that are expensive, but they're using them because of the very small voltages. You know, they want as least amount of resistance as they can get. Uh, copper is pretty good, but silver's better. Gold's really good. Uh, so it's, that does show up in computers sometimes. Um, so a very, very fine sort of um, wiring, I guess you could say, which is sort of uh, built into the motherboard. You can actually, if you turn the motherboard upside down underneath the green stuff, you can see some of the wiring there. And if, you'll notice if you look at the wiring, it, it, it'll be parallel lines of little wires. And those parallel lines we call bus, bus. Uh, and we call them a bus, the parallel lines is, is, is a high speed connection between one part of the computer and another. Um, and so we have a bus from the memory to the CPU, and then we have a bus from the rest of the motherboard to the CPU. So the CPU is in the middle there, and the bus is, is communicating. Now, the faster the bus and the closer you are to the bus, well, obviously the faster the processing could be as well, if you have a fast enough CPU. So the CPU, the faster the CPU, the more energy it uses, the more heat it makes. Another reason for using gold or silver or um, you know these high, uh, expensive things because they, uh, they're more conductive and they produce less heat because of resistance. They have res less resistance to the um, electrical current, but uh, any wire is gonna produce some resistance and that's gonna produce heat. Heat kills computers. And so there's heat being generated there. If you got a hot, if you got a very powerful CPU, it's going to be producing heat. And so what do we do? We have to remove that heat somehow. And so we typically will put a fan on top of the CPU to draw that heat out. We'll have other fans in the back of the computer to draw the heat out as well. And then you should operate your computer in a air conditioned environment. Air conditioned is as clean as you can get environment um, really. So uh, if you're doing a lot of sort of uh, high end computing, if you're, if you're working that computer hard, you wanna keep it cool. Uh, so people who I know have uh, burned out their computers because they're sitting in, sitting in the living room, right? And the computer gets hot, so what do they do? They put a pillow on their lap, all right? And then they put the computer in there. The problem with that is a pillow blocks the, the uh, vents. And then what happens is the computer cooks and won't start. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't put a pillow on your lap and put the computer in the pillow. It's okay to put a pillow on your lap, but then on top of that, put a board, you know what I mean? Yeah, so that the vents from the computer are not blocked. Otherwise, you will kill your computer, right? Ask me how I know. No, no, don't. It's a sad story. It makes me cry. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, the RAM, random access memory. Um, one of the cheapest ways to speed up your computer processing ability, the speed of your computer, is to add more RAM. Uh, so... That communication between the, the, the data that's being used and the processor. Obviously, having a faster CPU is another way. Uh, VGA card. Look at the VGA card. It looks like another mini little computer, doesn't it? It's even got a fan on it to cool it down. Why? Because it has a processor on it. It's, uh, so it has a processor which is similar to, a, to the CPU. Uh, but it is dedicated to handling yeah. graphics. So just a, the, the video. It's just there for the video. And uh, so if you have a application which has a lot of processing of video, and people do, they're doing CGI, uh, they're doing games which are very realistic. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, that's a lot of processing. Uh, if you want it to go fast without sort of being too jerky and being too pixelated, then you uh, will want to get a, a powerful VGA card. Sound card, same idea. I mean, obviously you can buy higher quality sound cards. You can connect them to sort of high fidelity um, equipment. Um, uh, hard disk. Um, so when I use the word hard disk, then what I would be meaning is a uh, device that has a spinning disk uh, inside of a um, sealed uh, container. So the container is sealed to keep the dust out, keep the dust out because dust particles are actually a lot bigger than the distance between the read write head and the surface. And so if dust got in there, it would crash the head. And so it's a dust, so they're, they're assembled in a dust free environment and you have a, um, a platter spinning at high speed. The closer that you get, you can get the read write heads to the surface, the more data you can store on the, on the disc. So you want to get them as close as you can. 
And so, of course, you, you must have dust excluded. And they will be fabricated in a dust-free environment. Uh, you might have seen these in movies somewhere, people uh, working in factories where they make hard drives and stuff like that. And you'll see they're all dressed in sort of, uh, you know, they look like those hazmat suits, but it's not to protect the person. <laughs> it's, it's to protect the computers <laughs> so that the person isn't putting dust all over them. <laughs> anyway, so, so um, uh, if you used a digital camera, you might have had some special card that went in the camera, which was it. Who's using that now, though, right? I mean, everybody just takes photos with their phone and it goes straight up onto the cloud somewhere, right? And so we, I mean, this is, uh, I suppose this is like the last five, 10 years, everything started to move onto the cloud, um, that our internet has got fast enough that we can do that. And you're so lucky. I mean, you're saving yourself so much time, right? You're just putting things on OneDrive or Dropbox or something like that. Uh, you've got all your stuff and you move from one computer to another. And all your stuff's still there, right? Because it's all on the cloud. That's how I like to do it. But in the old days, yeah, we used to <laughs> used to have a, a camera with a special. Uh, <laughs> oh, you might if you're using GoPro or a GoPro analog, you might still do it that way, right? Because that's a lot of data on a small card. Yeah, it's gonna take too long to go by, you know. But so yeah, you're just gonna use it on the so you have a card reader for that. Um, all right, so here's some input devices, and you might notice that they're all also what we'd call peripheral devices. They're outside the computer, and they're bringing input into the computer. I don't think I need to go over all of those. That makes sense. Uh, one that we didn't talk about, except there's a touch screen. Well, how awesome is that? Again, this is technology of the last 15, 20 years, and you're all using it. I mean, our phones are all touch, screen, touch screens, right? But uh, so is everybody's laptop, and, and we've got those other pad computers or whatever. And uh, processing devices, uh, the processing happens on a, uh, on a processing chip. Uh, we call that a central processing unit here, which is actually, you see that uh, there's a place here, that's where the chip goes. You put a plug the chip in there. Now, Intel is uh, one of the famous companies that makes some um, uh, CPU chips. They're not the only country, company. There's another one, AMD. Uh, but uh, Intel's got a good name, been around for a long time. I don't know if you're interested in the, the sort of how, how that works. Intel was, um, I think it was started in, um, in California, maybe, but anyways, it went over to Texas and uh, been in Texas. And then it went to, I think they're manufacturing in China or somewhere in Asia, but they're moving back. They're bringing their factories back to the United States. So, the, sorry? They went from the States? Yeah, for manufacturing. So many companies went to China to manufacture. So they set up their, what I mean, when they went to China, they built their factories in China, but now they're moving the factory back to the United States. So go think about that. There's, there's a whole big shift on that, that you will find. It's not part of our course. You don't need to know about it. It's something that might be interesting to you, but uh, that China thing seems to be changing now. And part of it is because of what happened in COVID. COVID. Um, Chinese cities locked down, they're still locked down. And so you can't get stuff out of them. You know what I mean? And so, and, and the other thing is Chinese workers are no longer as cheap as they used to be. Uh, it used to be like a Chinese worker was one sixth the price of an American worker. Now it's not. Now there's cheaper workers other places. Mexican workers are cheaper than Chinese workers. And so, you know, the factories are tending to sort of, and the other thing is China's not really so friendly to the United States as it used to be. So, yeah, I mean, at the moment you got uh, the uh, vice, you know, the, the speaker of the house, uh, the United States uh, Congress is going to Taipei. You know what Taipei is? Taipei is the capital of a little country called Taiwan, which China says is not a country. <laughs> China says, oh, that's one of our provinces. And every time somebody goes to, I, I went to Taiwan two years ago. loved it. Great time. <laughs> went and drove around it. <laughs> um, but uh, China says that tai Taiwan's not a country. Uh, Americans can't go there uh, on official trips because that's our province. And actually there was some Chinese dude said, uh, you know, wait, we'll, we'll shoot down her plane if they bring any fighters or anything like that. And she's going anyways. <laughs> That's happening today. You can look at that on the news tomorrow. So, uh, I mean, what I'm saying is they're talking not in a very friendly way. Kind of like how uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians are not talking in a friendly way. You know, yeah, yeah I mean, you know where that goes. Um, so here we go, some output devices. And most of these are, um, are um, we, we'd call them uh, peripherals as well, of course, because they're not inside the mother unit, uh, the um, 
system unit, monitors, printers, speakers, headphones, uh, GPSs. Now this is a plotter, which is a two dimensional drawing pr printer. And of course there's three dimensional printers. You heard of that? So you could do your home manufacturing. So this is a thing, right? You can, go, you can go online if you have a 3D printer and you can get uh, sort of instructions to make sort of stuff that you might want to make. I don't know, some hard, hard plastic stuff and it'll just make it for you, you know, like a, a model of the city of Qatar, uh, Doha. You could, you could get that and sort of just build it one bit at a time. Uh, but also other very useful things. I mean, people are saying that uh, if we can get the materials hard enough, then we could sort of like replace car parts and stuff like that. You know, oh, this thing broke on my car. Oh, that's all right. Just get my 3D printer out. And we'll print that up and put the new part back in there. If it was a plastic part, you could absolutely do that now. Uh, oh, the other thing there was uh, maybe we're talking about is the printers. Uh, we're talking about printers, right? Um, uh, 20 years ago, everybody had a printer in their house, right? You go to go to car four or something like that, you can buy a printer for 500 reels. And then you go to replace the toner. It cost you 400 reels every time. <laughs> no, or 600 reels to put a replace the toner. So people go, ah! And so a lot of people just don't have printers in their house anymore, right? So what they do instead is they make PDF documents and they send them to people. <laughs> or they come to work and print there. You know, you know what I mean? Tell me it's not true, right? I mean, how many of you got a printer in your house? Because who can afford the, the printer cartridges? Uh, sorry? Yeah, who is it? No need. Let's just do everything online, right? So instead of printing our document out and handing it to somebody, we'll turn it to a PDF and we'll send it to them on a, as an email attachment. And you know, th then it's their problem. If they want to print it, they can print it. But you know, I'm not going to print it because I'm not paying 400 rails for a blinking printer cartridge. Scanning, yeah. So as I say, you're going to scan documents, and they're they're going to be PDFs. And you got PDF editors, so you can edit the document. You got. PDF editors, which will let you put a signature on it. So uh, people are going paperless. And you know, maybe that's good for the environment. And so bye-bye, sad, sad, so sad for the, the printer companies. They kind of did themselves out of a business by charging too much for the, for the cartridges, I think. Oh, uh, well, some things there, uh, storage devices. Yeah, it's probably worth talking about the storage devices. I've already spent a little bit of time talking about the hard disk. So you can see the spinning platter there. There's more than one read-write head because there's more than one plat plates in the platters. Um, enough on that. The RAM. Uh, so uh, the RAM is where is uh, your storage memory uh, only while the computer's turned on. And um, that, as I said, that makes it go fast. Uh, the ROM, that's read-only memory. That's the firmware I was telling you about, right? So if you got a, a ROM chip in there, that's going to be some firmware. That's some instructions that are always going to run when the computer turns on. And so it's, it's part of the sort of the basic operating system of the computer, usually. Uh, DVDs. Very nice, cheap backup medium, you know, um, but the problem is who's got a DVD writer nowadays, right? So we all thought that was a great idea for a while, but they break and uh, I don't know, it takes up, people have all moved on to these uh, sort of smaller notebooks and they're really powerful and they got none, none of these devices on them, right? So then they have to just put everything in the cloud. But DVD, yeah, it's fine. Floppy, oh man, I, you have to be old to remember floppies. Any of you guys use floppies? Oh, you're not that old. I thought I'm the only one old enough to use floppies. Yeah, so I mean, uh, the last one I used would have been like 20 years ago. So maybe you have some kind of legacy computer somewhere around. <laughs> you, use, you use a floppy now? Yeah, okay, so there's legacy computers. I mean, to be fair, in 1987, I was programming with COBOL. And you know, that's a 1950s language. So some of this stuff hangs around for a while. Yeah, especially if it's in a big business. They hold on to their old way of doing things. Some, some of them, some of them very fast to change. Memory cards, this was stuck in your, uh, in your uh, phone. Could be in your phone. Could be in your, um, in your GoPro uh, camera. A pen drives, who's using that now? Oh, and look at that. Can you believe it? We used to store data on those things, really. Now the problem with the tape is it's um, serial uh, storage and serial recall. So. You, you know, it's, if you want to find something in the tape, you know, maybe it's halfway through the tape. So you have to spin all your way through the tape to get to it. You know, or if it's, a, it's not a great way. With something like this, you've got a dynamic access. And so you've got an index on the outside of the, or the inside. So it's, one, it's the first track, I think that's the outside. But um, so uh, the first thing that happens is that 
is it reads the index. From the index, it knows where everything is. So you say, oh, I want such and such button. Go straight to it. Right. As opposed to, got it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the tape. So it wasn't good for, um, how you say, uh, uh, real time applications because you just have to wait. But it was great for store stuff overnight. You know, so I've, I've done all my, my accounting for the day and I don't want to lose those numbers. Oh, I'll just save it to the tape. That's fine. Perfect for that. Um, because, you know, yeah, I'm not going to go through those numbers. One of the, you know what I mean? I just, I just want to make sure they're there. They're safe. And then I'm going to take it to another place. Um, you know, because so my accounting's here on this computer. I'll take that tape to another building. And so if there's a fire and, uh, you know, my, my computers are all burned up, that's okay. I got the tape. You know, and I'll just put that onto another computer, and there's all my accounting. Now, in um, in a much better, bigger scale than that, I used to work in a telephone company in Australia. Every night, they they used to take big tapes of all the of all the um, transactions that happened during the day, and that would go to a offsite storage. So, just in case there was um, uh, some problem, actually, they had a lot of other. We 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 call that redundant. They had a lot of redundancies built into that. That's backup. But they had redundancies too. They'd have two computers doing the same thing. So if one computer went out, they still stay alive like that with the other one. That's how banks have to work because banks can't lose a single transaction, right? They lose a transaction, somebody's out of money. And so they're running two computers at the same time uh, in different places. And that's expensive, but you know, banks make a bit of money. So I suppose they can afford it, right? Uh, banks are also people that have a lot of computing people, right? So uh, one of them is the uh, telephone companies. Yeah, go there. The other one is, yeah, banks. There's a job for you at the banks in your digital marketing or whatever. They, they have to have a um, computing presence because people, a lot of people don't want to bank by walking to a bank. You know, they want to be able to bank on the phone, right? And so, yeah, there's a lot of work involved in that. Uh, network interface card. In the old days, the computers were just built as a standalone unit. And then we decided we wanted to connect them to the internet. How do you do that? Well, you have to connect them to a wire or some radio. And so uh, the, uh, you, you would have a card that would make that possible. And there would be a port in the card where you could put an ethernet cable. Now the yellow, the white cables coming out of the ground here, there there's some black ones and, uh, and blue ones. Uh, those cables coming out of there. So, now some of those would be power cables, uh, but I think there might also be some internet cables. Yeah, so I can see them plugged in here, they're Ethernet cables. Uh, so those cables are faster than using the Wi-Fi. We have Wi-Fi in this room. There's two Wi-Fi um, uh, access points. We call those access points. So I can see them there. And so that's providing Wi-Fi for anybody who's using it. So I'm using it on my phone. You're probably using it on your phone and sort of scrolling through there instead of listening to me. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but that's only possible because of that, unless you're using 5G, right? Yeah, but who would use 5G, you know, when you got free Wi-Fi, right? So, uh, uh, so yeah, so the Wi-Fi is there, um, but these computers are not using that. Uh, we got faster, fa faster uh, computing than that. Uh, sorry, network than that, because we've got that uh, through that Ethernet cable. And I was looking to see if there's a communication box in here. There's not. Somewhere in one of these rooms, there'll be a communication Wi box. Uh, it's slow relative to the cable. It's still, yeah, but it's, I mean, it's much faster than it was last year. You know, it's faster last year than the year before. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's fast enough. But, um, you know, if you're doing high, pro, high, um, high volume processing, yeah, then cables are going to be faster. And the fastest cables are going to be your fiber cables. And that's what, uh, so that's the great thing about being in a small country like Qatar. Uh, when I say small, I'm talking about small geographically. It's not very long and not very wide. So uh, the engineers who build out the, the telecom network, uh, that's not too hard to do. And they've brought fiber into just about everybody's house. Uh, so you've got fiber to the wall plug, where uh, then you have a, a Urdu box sort of sit in there and plugs into that fiber. And then you've got pretty high speed internet. Most people have got that available to them. So, I mean, you know, 20 years ago and in some other countries that are not as lucky as Qatar, uh, they have much slower leaks coming. Now, some people say, well, you can leapfrog over that by just doing some kind of space thing, right? You know, so you can have satellite um, communications. 
anyway, so if you had an old laptop computer and it didn't have a built-in Wi-Fi radio, you could uh, buy a device like this and just plug that in. Um, this, this device here is one that plugs into the wall and then into a cable. And it's the same as the device we've got up there, except these are you know, commercial standard. Um, you know, that you didn't buy at Carrefour. <laughs> you know, I mean, the, uh, their Linksys, um, sorry, Cisco, their Cisco equipment and modems. Uh, so. How do they group some apps? Uh, like if you use university Wi-Fi, you cannot access the website or Snapchat. Yeah, so we have this concept of a firewall. Uh, so firewall software is going to be loaded onto the communication device that might be at the router. Uh, so a router is a device that is the is in between your network and any other network. If you join two networks together, then you have a router. So in your house, you have a router because you have your Wi-Fi network, which is everybody who's who's in your house and you want to communicate with the rest of the world. Then you have to join onto a Rigo's network. And so at the route with router, you can program the router to filter out particular things. So you can filter out different, okay, so I don't know if you want a communications uh, lecture, I don't know, but uh, the, the actual uh, communication is in things called packets. So a packet of communication is, has got, uh, it, think of it as like an envelope with all the, all the data is inside and it's got a, um, an address thing at the front and at the back, it's got some other instructions. And so we break up all of our communications into these packets and different packets look different. And so the router can tell what kind of packet it is. And based on what kind of packet, it can do things with it. So for example, there was a while ago uh, that Arito uh, was blocking uh, Skype. I don't think they do anymore. So, so they, could, they could tell when a packet came, they could tell that that was a voice over IP packet. And they're like, oh, just block that. Because you know that's, our, that's, that's money that we could have going over our circuit switch network that's uh, going through this way, which is cheaper. So we'll just block that. I don't, they're not blocking it now. I use Skype all the time, but they could also. What's yeah, so, yeah, whatever they want. If they can figure out what's in the packet, they can block it. <laughs> Cause, uh, so that's the thing. So you got your engineer. So the packets, you know, they're gonna be typically, you're going to encrypt them. And so it's kind of hard to do that, but you got smart engineers working there at Arito, and they're like, oh, well, you know, ah, look, we found out that this packet looks like this. This is the signature of this packet. Now we know what that packet is, we can block it. Yeah, so that's why we use a VPN. <laughs> so a VPN, anything that goes through a VPN, that's kind of like a tunnel and the whole thing, everything from start to end is encrypted. And it's very hard for Arito or them to look at that. And so that's why you could, sorry? Yeah, so the, the, the problem with the VPN is we use a VPN because we want to watch American videos or something on Netflix, right? And that's fine, but be careful because they got other ways of knowing what you're doing because you have a GPS on your computer, on your on your phone or your thing, right? So and uh, the GPS says, "Oh, you're in Doha." <laughs> oh, sorry, you can't watch that American yeah, stuff. Really <laughs> sorry. Yes, the of the packet, but the but if the if the uh, the system that you're communicating with has access to your GPS, they're gonna know that you're in Doha. And they're not only gonna know you're in Doha, they're gonna know you're in Doha here at this college, yeah? Sorry? So, I suppose, so yeah, on your phone, if you wanna use that, sort of block the GPS. Good luck with that. Because you'll find that, for example, certain applications won't work unless the GPS is turned on. So for example, Ithras, try using that without, and you know, what can you do without Ithras? <laughs> and some people do that yeah or you know have two phones one for it and one for all that stuff that you want other stuff that you want to do anyway so yeah um it's kind of like an arms race so there's people trying to figure out ways to get around all the blocks and stuff like that and then there's the engineers trying to block them and you know they have their reasons and i'm not saying that they're all wrong right you know there's probably some stuff that's good to block um, but then, you know, there's stuff that we want, like that American movie. <laughs> I don't want it. I care about that. <laughs> but, but maybe you do. Uh, anyways, so uh, Yellowstone, right? <laughs> Any Yellowstone fans here? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, right. So we talk about this idea of um, the operating system. How are we doing for time? We still got another 20 minutes. Um, 
the operating system uh, is, you can think of it as a layer of software that sits between the, the hardware and, and the applications that we use. Uh, and so the, the, uh, soft, the operating system will take instructions from the, from the uh, applications and then we'll uh, translate those into something that the, the hardware can understand. And so operating systems include things like uh, uh, Windows, uh, whatever is the latest version of Windows, uh, 2020 maybe, I don't know, 2020, do they have one? It's pretty new. Um, Windows uh, 6, no. Honestly, I don't know which, what the number is now. Um, but then your, your, um, your Apple, you've got iOS for Apple, you've got Linux, which will work on just about anything. Uh, it, they, you've got uh, an operating system for your phone. If you're using uh, the Apple one, again, you're going to use the iOS. If you're using uh, anything else like Samsung, you're going to be using Android. That's an operating system. And so that operating system will communicate directly to the hardware. So uh, it's, written, it's written to communicate to the hardware. What, so what do I mean by communicate to the hardware? It'll do things like refresh the screen. It'll do things like load up data from the memory or something like that. And of course, all of our other applications need to do those. So they'll, they'll give a communication through to the operating system, which will then instruct the hardware. Um, so the operating system, uh, a large part of the operating system, not all of it, but most of it has to be up in the mem in the working memory in that RAM. It has to be it has to be loaded up into the RAM so that it can work as we're going. And the process, which where we go from having nothing on our computer working or our phone, uh, to where the operating system is now loaded into the memory, uh, we call that process booting. And booting is sort of sh short for bootstrapping. And bootstrapping is sort of short for pull yourself up by your bootstraps, uh, which is sort of a not a very kind statement that uh, people, so a lot of people don't like to hear it. Um, that, uh, but it's, as I say, it's not a very kind statement, but basically it means that you can start from nothing, which is your bootstraps. Can you imagine pulling yourself up by your bootstraps? Yeah, it's get down on the ground and pull yourself up, basically. And uh, so in your computer, it means starting from nothing, from nothing on bootstrapping, you go to the point where you now have operating system sitting in the memory. Now I can give it instructions. Now I can do things. Uh, so that's what we mean by booting. Um, so yeah, uh, operating systems now uh, are typically graphical. So point and click, that's how we use the Windows operating system. We have all kinds of icons. I mean, you know, you delete something by clicking and dragging and putting it over a, a, a rubbish bin kind of thing, right? Those ideas actually came from Apple. There's some operating systems we mentioned, Windows, iOS, Linux, or Linux, and uh, Android. Oh, so here we are. I think we're just about done here. Six basic categories of computers. So we got the embedded computer. That's a computer that's inside some other machine. So if you have a car, it has computers in it. Uh, for at least 30 years, 20 years, 30 years, uh, cars have had computers in them. And that, that's been really good because it saved gasoline and diesel uh, and saved the environment a little bit. And so those computers, what they would do is they would carefully manage the mixture of the, um, of the gasoline and the air that went into the combustion chamber. So we had fuel injection instead of the old carburetors. Now the old carburetors, those cars would run awesome if you had them tuned right. But most of the time they weren't tuned right. And so as a result, you were sending a lot of the gasoline straight out the pipe. You know what I mean? And so that's not great. And uh, also you'd get a lot of carbon monoxide and nit nitrous oxide and they're poisonous and they're also greenhouse gases. And so that would be bad. And so if you tune the, if you tune the, um, the, the car better, you can get that out of that. So a computer will do that on the fly in real time to your specification. And so that's what you have. You have a, we, we call it a map, which is on your, uh, on your uh, car's computer, uh, the, the computer that's on the motor. Uh, so it has a map and that map will control exactly how much gasoline to how much oxygen at which RPM, at which oxygen level. So if, if you have that computer, you'll notice that you got sensors all over your car. You got an oxygen sensor in the exhaust uh, to make sure that you got the right amount of uh, oxygen there because you've got a catalytic converter. Uh, anyway, so I'm talking about cars, maybe some of you, no one like cars, and you'll be, be aware of that. So uh, if you're a petrol head, so that's the phrase that goes down to the racetrack and really cares about cars, 
you'd find that you have a port on your car, especially if it's a high performance mm -hmm. car, where you can plug your laptop computer into it. You say, hey, you know what? That map that we got, I'd like to get a li little bit more power out of my car. And so you can tweak it. And you, know, you so well, that's what they do. They send the car around the racetrack really and, awesome. and the, with a particular map, and then the guy will change it and he'll tune it until he gets it so that he's getting faster times. Now, the problem with that in, um, the, the problem with that is that the way they've been tuned naturally is to be a little bit hotter because the hotter you have, uh, the, the, it burns up more of the fuel. And, but the problem with hot is it also burns up car engines. And so that, that, that's a, a little bit of a thing that you have, uh, and people do try and tweak that a little bit. Yeah, anyway, so yeah. Uh, the other thing is you'll find vehicles that will come with more than one map. And so you'll have a little switch in the vehicle where you can switch from sport mode to sort of uh, economy mode. And so you're changing maps. So the computer's got, and each of those maps is like a little program, like firmware. Anyway, so that would be an embedded computer. It's a computer, it's in your car. You can reprogram it. And yeah, so mobile devices, I love these. Um, so a friend of mine is leaving Qatar and that's his only computing device. And I sort of, I'm looking forward to when I become useful enough at using these that I could say that. But you know, the computer will, the, the phone will do it. Basically almost anything that you can do on your laptop, you can do on the phone. Um, but can you, you know, are your eyes and your fingers good enough, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, you can write web, you can write computer programs. I mean, you can download onto your phone uh, computer comp compilation languages. You can write Python code. You can write Java code and test it on your, on your phone. Uh, you, can, you can create web pages. <laughs> if, but, but who will, right? Everybody wants a, a 64 inch screen. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, yeah. Um, personal computers, so that you can have that 64 inch screen and the earphones and you know the keyboard. I only know about that because I got a 16 year old daughter. And uh, servers. Now the thing about a server is that's a a uh, machine which is going to serve more than one person usually. Uh, so servers are going to provide a high level of service to usually multiple people or multiple applications. And so that's going to be a bit more high, higher level um, bit of computing. So faster processors, more ports and uh, more heats. And so it needs to be in a room which is carefully controlled, that type of thing. So we have these things called server rooms where we find those. And so here in the college, we have down in building three, uh, a, um, uh, we call it our data center and it's full of servers. And it's got two different kinds of servers there. It's got communication servers, which connects everybody to everything. And then it has um, our application servers or, and, and it has data servers. So three different kinds of servers. So a server is going to do one of those functions, provide communications, uh, provide applications or provide um, data storage. Uh, now, some big companies, that is now their business plan. So Amazon, what does Amazon do? Sells you stuff, but it also sells you movies. You can watch movies on Amazon, but also you can go to Amazon um, uh, data services, AWS, and you can put your whole business onto a server that they would have in Iceland or, or Ireland. Uh, so they have big, what we, some people call them server farms, but sort of big buildings that are just full of servers. And you can rent space on that server for your business. Uh, and uh, so that's what we call um, all of these services, uh, you know, that are on the cloud, on the cloud. Um, so you can put your whole business on there, all your data stored there, all your applications stored there. And so what that means is that anywhere in the world, people can sort of just immediately connect to that server and they're connecting to you. It's not localized here in Qatar. You know, it's happening out there. And that's kind of good, I think. Well, yeah, there's a lot of reasons that I'll not go into now because we don't have a lot of time. Uh, mainframe computers, yeah. So if you're a bank, you probably don't want to do that. You don't want to put your business out there on uh, on uh, Iceland, right? Who knows? Maybe the Russians will, will uh, invade Iceland. <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. But supposing they did, then, uh, you know, all your high net worth customers at the bank, the, the Russians have got your, your computers, right? So that would be really kind of bad. And they probably wouldn't like that. Uh, the other place that wouldn't like that, as I said, so banks, 
The other one is, again, telephone companies, right? So Arito is not going to put its business up there in Iceland. No, because uh, that, that this is important stuff, right? I mean, communications and banks, they're really important. The next thing to them is like your military. Uh, and actually, a lot of countries, their telecommunications um, is sort of intertwined with the military. And so, yeah, they don't want anybody else having access to that, right? That's our stuff. You guys stay away. Have your nice time out there in Ireland and Iceland, but we're just going to keep it here because you know that's the way we like it. And yeah, so they would have mainframe computers. I don't know where they are. And so the security is the theme there, right? I don't know where uh, Rito's mainframe computers are, but for sure they're there. There's probably a reason why I don't know where they are because they don't want me to know where they are, right? It's a need to know. You don't need to know. Why? Because they want it safe, right? Suppose some guy is in Doha. He doesn't like Qatar. I can't imagine anybody who would be like that. But, you know, maybe there's somebody who's like that. Uh, you know, one thing that they could do would make it really bad for Qatar would be to knock out the mainframes there. Uh, and so they don't want them doing that. Now, I know it's like that because I used to work in a telephone company in Australia and our server, um, build, our buildings with our servers in them, they were uh, dis uh, disguised. I mean, you know, they looked like football stadiums. You know, there was no corporate uh, anything on it. it. The only reason why I knew that, that it was ours is because I went there. And uh, and the only way you could get in was in it was it with an invitation. Uh, and I assume that it would, might be like that now. So yeah, don't go driving around Doha looking for the big sign which says, you know, uh, Arito servers, you're not gonna find it. And uh, that's good. Uh, supercomputers, as it says, that's going to be um, Super, super fast. Uh, there's a couple of companies that make these very, very fast computers and they tend to be kind of kind of expensive. Cray used to be the ones that they used to use. Uh, I don't know what the fastest ones are now. If you were a crypto miner, that's what you'd want. <laughs> you'd want one of them. Um, so I don't know if cryptocurrency was worth something, but yeah, something that was really, really fast. Uh, back in the 1980s, Australia had one supercomputer and it was um, owned by the tax office. I mean, you know, those are the kind of people that, that use those type of things. So, I mean, uh, the United States government, they got lots of things going on. It, if there was supercomputers in the United States, they would have them. And there we go. Uh, any questions? No.